This is just absolutely beautiful. We sit in this beautiful lodge with a crystal chandelier and talk about the persecuted church. <laughs> Life is hard back here in the coastlands. Because it's the wrong side. All right. I want to jump right in um, just so that I can stay on track time-wise. So briefly before uh, we jump in, I just want to say this, that when, <clears throat> when we look at the, um, the model of evangelism, if you will, of the apostles, I'll call it the apostolic apologetic and you look at their model, because there, there are so many models, obviously, of evangelism uh, out there and so many different sort of approaches that we take. But when you look at the primary sort of tools that the apostles would pull out of their pouch, in the book of Acts in particular, it was always, of course, they were dealing with a largely biblically literate uh, audience, but they're often saying this, they're pointing to events in their day, obviously, relating to Jesus and his life and things that had transpired with that. But they would point to the scriptures and they would say, this is that which was written of by the prophet this or that. And so they were constantly pointing to biblical prophecy and its fulfillment in their day as it related to the events of Jesus as an apologetic for their message. So how do you guys know, you know, that what we're saying concerning Jesus is true? And then they would point to the prophets. So first of all, it was biblical prophecy. And then second, it was silver and gold have I none, but what I do have, you know, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get up and walk. So the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, the release of miracles and these sort of things, these were the two primary sort of weapons in the apostles arsenal in terms of leading people to faith now today the issue of biblical prophecy is very rarely used as an apologetic for the gospel in fact it seems like we'll use just about anything other than that and understandably so because there's been a lot of abuses and you know uh, it's biblical prophecy is a bit of a minefield but the reason that I'm mentioning this is because before uh, I jump into this message. I want to make it very clear. Um, I'm not a big fan of looking at passages simply to analyze them from a prophetic perspective and then saying, that's it, adios. However, because of the fact that, uh, you know, the Doyles uh, shared just before this and we'll hear more from them, I'm, I'm confident that you all will understand the application is whatever you do, don't listen to what I'm saying today as, and use it as an excuse to be fearful or angry toward Muslims. Um, there's a tension oftentimes in the scriptures where the Lord will say some incredibly harsh things. And you can zero in on those particular passage and those themes and just leave it at that. And yet you're citing scripture and yet you can walk in a completely ungodly spirit. Um, because unless we take into consideration the full counsel of the scriptures and the full testimony in the heart of God, we can actually run with very biblical themes and still apply it wrongly. And so I'm going to just be, this session largely just talking about biblical prophecy, but by the same token, it's, it's kind of negative with regard to the Islamic world. And again, that's, that's relevant. You know, a lot of the things that Daniel shared earlier, you know, there's a lot of negative realities. We, we're, we don't want to be part of the church that says, well, we don't want to talk about anything negative because it's too negative. And you go, well, you do realize there's a lot of negative realities and things discussed in the Bible. Um, we want to be aware of those things, but we want to respond rightly. And that's in a Christ-like attitude. So that's always going to be the application. Here's the information. How do we apply it? Well, we apply it by responding as Jesus would respond. How did he treat us when we were his enemies? Well, he embraced flesh and he allowed himself to be mutilated so that his enemies could become his children. Like That's completely foreign to a natural response. And um, we're living in an age that is incredibly politicized. I mean, you know, you can't even get on social media without 
getting into some sort of conflict and everybody hates everybody else. And so it's incredibly polarized and we want to be real careful. We always want our response to be a Christ-like response. I want to um, begin just before I jump in and sort of highlight this reality. Again, um, just by looking at Genesis uh, 12, verses 1 through 3. Now, let me just begin by saying this. The, um, <clears throat> is that the first? Do you have, uh, what's the, do you, is it, does it say what comes next? Oh, I, I just started preaching the wrong message. Um, <laughs> Well, since I'm started, rather than me changing everything, could I be and impose upon the sound guy and actually do what's next in biblical prophecy, which is my other PowerPoint? I'll give you a minute to uh, tweak that. I think it'll be easier for you to adjust than for me and for everybody else, because I don't want to say the same thing twice later. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let me just reframe this. Oh, okay. Some of the things that Daniel was talking about uh, in the first session, he was talking about Abraham and the, the model through which the Lord has chosen to redeem everything, his promised plan of redemption. How do you summarize the model that God is, has chosen to redeem all of the cosmos, all of the earth? It doesn't mean everyone's getting saved, but he is going to restore all of creation. And it's amazing that the way that the creator of everything chose to do it is this way. He chose a man. He, he looked out at all these pagans. They were violent. And he calls a man named Abram. He renames him. He becomes Abraham. And then he goes, I'm going to give you a child. And, in, and then he's going to be multiplied. And so he turns Abraham into a family. He turns that family into a nation, which he then gives them a set of laws. He, he, he creates um, a holy womb, if you will, that will give birth to the Messiah, whereby he can actually enter time and space, and then he disciples all the nations into the knowledge of God. And when all is said and done, Jesus will be on the throne in Jerusalem, sitting on the restored throne of his father David. There will be a restored kingdom of Israel. The knowledge of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And they will go out and send emissaries to the nations throughout the earth. And the Gentiles will be progressively discipled into the things of God. And ultimately, at the conclusion of that period, everything will be handed over. And all of creation will be restored. It will be something far better than even the Garden of Eden. Something far better than the most glorious period during the Davidic and, and Solomonic uh, kingdoms of Israel, combine Eden, combine the kingdom of Solomon, combine the kingdom of David, mix it all together, just put some, you know, glory all over it, mayonnaise or mustard, whichever, and you're beginning to get a glimpse of what the age to come is going to be like, and that's very different than what it presently is, but in order to do that, he just called a man named Abram. It's just such an incredibly mundane, simple thing. It's like you plant this little brown seed. It's just this dried up little kernel. And it's the strangest thing when you think about the reality that the seed then cracks open. And all of a sudden this little shoot comes out. And by the end of the summer, you're like, this thing just took over the whole corner of my house. And how, how I didn't trim this, you know what I mean? Like what comes out of a seed is so different. But this is how the Lord works. He called Abram. Okay, so this is where it begins with the calling of Abraham, and then we know the story. He gives, you know, the Abrahamic covenant, the promise, and it evolves and it spreads to the Davidic covenant, eventually the new. This is where it all begins, Genesis 12, verse 1, 2, and 3. I'm actually going to begin with uh, verse 2. The Lord says to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. Now, for all of those of us who are Christians, who say we are pro-Israel, this is the verse, these are the verses that we quote over and over and over again. So every time something negative happens in the news, any kind of anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, we go, aha, if you curse Israel, you're going to be cursed. 
If you bless Israel, you'll be blessed. And we, we repeat that like a mantra. Now, that is true because the Lord promised if, you bless, if people bless Abraham's descendants, his seed, his collective seed, his family, you'll be blessed. And if you curse them, you'll be cursed. But here's the thing. We always leave out the next sentence. And this is all part of the same statement. Because the Lord continues and he says, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. And so here's the thing is yes, this is true. The Lord chose a unique, specific people through which he would bring his promised plan of redemption. But do you know why? Because he loves everybody. He loves all the peoples of the earth. And so I always love to sort of put a tweak on Genesis 3, uh, I mean Genesis, on John, uh, John 3.16. Um, God, so the, the, God so loved the world that he chose Israel. And that just drives our replacement theology friends crazy, but that's the point, is God loves everyone so much that he chose Abraham, turned him into Israel, through which came the Messiah. It's very simple. So we have to maintain this unique calling and election that God has placed on his people Israel, but not miss the fact that it's for everybody, every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. If we lose sight, if we just focus on one of these elements then our, our pro-Israel, our Christian pro-Israel attitude, it can become very actually carnal and sort of just this nationalistic rah, rah, rah Israel sort of thing. But we have to understand the larger redemptive purpose behind all of it. The reason that we bless Israel is because it is ultimately this piece of property over there in the Middle East. Well, what's so important about this piece of property? This is the launching pad whereby he is going to complete and affect his promised plan of redemption for all the nations. That's the spot that Jesus is going to rule from. And these are the people that he has chose to sort of, uh, can, in, ongoing, in, in, in an ongoing way, to be a blessing to all the nations. So we need to understand the larger picture. Okay, I'm done with my qualifiers before we jump into this. You're beginning with a map there. <clears throat> Once we understand the backdrop of the biblical story, God chose Abraham, turned him into a family, turned him into Israel. His ultimate long-term purpose is to bring forth Jesus, whereby all the nations will be redeemed. Then we understand the very simple context of the Bible. Okay, so I got a map. I put the Star of David right there, essentially on the throne of David, there in Jerusalem, the location that the God of the universe has chosen for, to be the dwelling place of his feet. Like that's just, every time I go to Jerusalem, I look around, I go, an amazing city, amazing history, layers and just layers of history and so forth. Parts of it, if you go to the wrong areas, can be a little bit trashy, way too many tour buses. And I, but I look at it and I go, this is where the God that made the galaxies that I can't even count this is where he said he's going to live forever. Like that is just like what it is now, the seed that it is now, and what it will blossom into is the, 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 the divide between the two is just amazing. But you have to sometimes look through the natural and go, this is where this thing is all going. So this is the spot. And because of that, it also just happens to be the center of controversy. And that will increasingly become the case the closer that we get to the return of the Messiah. That, that like a storm, like the eye of the storm, that Jerusalem is going to pull all the nations into, this, into the center of this controversy. And so it's simply acknowledging the fact that that is the context of the Bible. It's the context of all, all the stories. The Bible is and always been thoroughly Jerusalem, Israel, and Middle Eastern centric, right? And we here in the United States... Um, tend to often think that the world revolves around us because, you know, uh, that's what we're infamous for. And um, as soon as we have Bible prophecy question and answer, the first question is always, Joel, where is America in Bible prophecy? Do they, when you speak in Australia, does someone say, you know, hey, Daniel, where is Australia in Bible prophecy? No one asks that, right? It's just not a question. Americans always ask that question. So we need to that the story 
is about Jerusalem, that that's the center. Once we understand that, we can understand biblical prophecy so much easier when we understand that this thing is an Israel-centric story. So we're going to begin with um, Daniel 8, understanding that in terms of what are the next major events that are um, emerging. (laughs) You know something? I actually just did do the prelude for my other message, but it's okay. It'll all make sense. We're going to pull it together here, folks. We're professionals. (laughs) It's a good start. It works. I shouldn't have said anything. You wouldn't have known. That's true. Just keep rolling, man. That, by the way, was like the biggest lesson when I started speaking was like, what if I mess up? And then you're like, who cares? Just act like it's another. No one else cares. You know, you know the thing like, Um, you get in a fight with somebody and they're like, I know you've been talking about me. You're like, I am way too selfish to even think about you. Honestly, like, (laughs) I'm thinking about myself most of the time. So go to the next map. The next major event, in my opinion, sort of within biblical prophecy, and when we look at this, um, we'll see that it begins to make sense and we'll understand why we're looking at you know, what comes next in biblical prophecy. Again, because when we see biblical prophecy fulfilled, as I said, it is a powerful apologetic for the reliability of the scriptures. So I believe that Daniel 8 may be, and I say this may, uh, and it's increasingly looking like that is the case, the next sort of major event in the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. And this is something that I think we should take the time to look at. Now, Essentially, what this is, is a conflict between Iran, modern-day Iran, ancient biblical Persia, the Medes and the Persians, and Turkey, the, the Republic of Turkey today, as it's called. In ancient times, this was simply Asia Minor. So, you know, we sort of look at that, just sort of the back and forth between those two, and we can see, again, the center of the context of the scriptures down there in Israel. Now, we're going to begin in Daniel 8, verses 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar the king, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. So previously is Daniel 7. This is the vision of the four gruesome beasts. Um, And I looked in the vision, and while I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa. So he's in modern-day Shush, which is in Iran, Uh, which is in the province of Elam, again, the southwest province of Iran. I looked in the vision, I was beside the Ulai Canal. Okay, so he just sort of introduces it. Go to the next map. I put up just a green star just to give you the location of where he saw himself. Now, in in the natural, he was in Babylon, which is about 50 miles south of Baghdad, about 200 miles. Is, Is the mic cutting out, or is that just me? Okay, I can't, it's hard for me to tell. My ears are all clogged up too and I'm deaf. Um, so it's about 200 miles to the west of the Green Star is where Babylon was, just south of Baghdad. But in the vision, he sees himself there in what is today modern day Iran. So that's where he sees himself. Um, verses three through four, he says, behold a ram. So he sees a ram with two horns is standing in front of the canal. So again, he's there in Susa, he sees a ram. The two horns were long, one was longer than the other, with the longer one coming up last. And the ram starts budding out from the region, again, of southwest, modern-day Iran. It's budding westward, northward, and southward. And no other beast could stand before him, nor was there anyone to rescue from his power. But he did as he pleased, and he magnified himself. Okay? So, again, a two-horned ram, two horns, one's longer than the other, comes out from the region of modern-day Iran, ancient Persia, and he's budding out throughout the area of the modern-day Middle East, Iraq, Syria, that whole kind of region, as well as southward. While I'm observing, verse 5 through 6, behold, a male goat. So now there's another guy that comes along. And it's interesting because he goes, and look, the, the ram, he did as he pleased. He magnified himself. This is just like in modern day boxing, you know, or MMA or whatever. You know, there's always some new guy comes along. He's the biggest, he's the baddest. Like, man, no one can beat him. He's invincible until some guy comes along and beats him. And then you're like, no one can beat that guy. You know what I mean? And, and eventually everyone hits 40. There's a new, a new beast comes along and knocks him out. 
We're all just human. So all of a sudden, now you've got the goat, the shaggy goat. And this thing comes from the west, and he's coming over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. The goat just has this one big single horn between his eyes. It's a unicorn goat. He came up to the ram that had two horns that previously did as he pleased, magnified himself. No one could rescue from his power. And he comes up to him with mighty wrath. Verse 7, I saw him come beside the ram. He was enraged at him. So there's rage on behalf of the shaggy goat toward the ram. He struck the ram. He shattered his two horns. The ram had no strength to withstand him. So he hurled him to the ground and he trampled on him. And there was none to rescue from his power. Okay, so now he's, the, he's the, the alpha goat, I guess, the alpha unicorn goat. That's weird. <laughs> Verse 8. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly, but as soon as he was mighty, as soon as he, he's magnified himself, the large horn was broken off. And in its place come four conspicuous horns. So one horn is broken off, four new ones come up. And again, I threw up a picture because apparently there is a breed of goats, which, and I think, I might be wrong, but I think they're Syrian. I'm almost sure they're Syrian, if I get that right. And yeah, they have actually have four horns. So again, just to reiterate, uh, looking at the map, um, essentially what, it's, what the vision so far is portraying, uh, go to the next map, is just this conflict, or the next slide, Again, between the two-horned ram from the region of Persia, or modern-day Iran, and then over here in Turkey. Now, um, or to the west is what it begins with, but we're going to look at this in a little more detail. Now, out of these four, it says, out of one of these four horns that comes out of the shaggy goat, out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great, specifically toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land, which is a reference to Israel. So this little horn, it begins little, it becomes gray, and it grows in that direction. Again, very apocalyptic language, um, very symbolic language, but as we'll see, and this is what's so wonderful about the Bible, is that whenever you have these symbolic, difficult, apocalyptic passages, an angel comes along and he tells us what it means. It's very simple. And what's so funny is then people will say, yeah, but Joel, don't you think the horn means this? And I go, well, I think it probably means what the angel says it means. You know, it's like, it's like we get into interpreting all these things and just don't bother reading the next several verses because it's usually laid out. So now I've put up a chart to show you the most common interpretation of this vision. The most common interpretation among those who believe the Bible, I've got, hun I've, I'm, I've got probably now, I don't know, maybe 170 commentaries on Daniel. I love the book of Daniel. And there are a lot of them that are written by unbelievers. Can you imagine that? Giving your life to write if you're an unbeliever. Like, it's just got commentaries on the Bible. It's such a weird thing. Um, or they are just so liberal that they're sort of an unbeliever. They don't believe it was actually written by Daniel. It was written by a Daniel pretender, and, you know, which is, to me is a fraud. Um, and so on and so forth. But among those who are believers... They believe the book of Daniel was written by Daniel. The most common interpretation is essentially this, that the first few verses, the part that speak of the ram, the goat, and the four horns, that part of the vision has been fulfilled historically with the Medo-Persian um, sweep through the Middle East, with Alexander the Great's response from Greece as he then defeated the, um, the Medo-Persian invasion, but then when you get to verses 9 through 12 with the little horn, they say, well, that has sort of dual fulfillment, both historical as well as end-time prophetic, because they'll say it was partially or sort of fulfilled in a shadow manner by Antiochus Epiphanes, who this, he was uh, alive and causing all kinds of trouble during the intertestamental period. Uh, as recorded in the book of Maccabees and so forth, but he was a bad guy. I mean, he came into Israel, killed over 40,000. He made, essentially, the practice of Judaism illegal, exiled another 40,000. I mean, he was a bad, bad guy. But they go, but he's a forerunner or a foreshadow, a prefigurement, a type of the Antichrist. And ultimately, these verses 9 through 12, they will be most ultimately fulfilled in, by the Antichrist. Okay, so how many of you are tracking with that so far? You have a vision which begins with the historical and it sort of bleeds into the last days. 
And uh, that's what I've always adhered to. And the overwhelming, vast 99.9% .9 of all the commentaries on Daniel are going to affirm that position. In fact, many people say that the details of the prophecy are so specific that it has to be prophecy that was written after the fact concerning the events of Medo-Persia, Alexander the Great, his death. They go, it's just too specific. They go, it has to have been written by a fraud who wrote it after the fact. But here's the thing, is that there's actually a lot of historical problems with it. And most people don't focus on the problems because they're so just sort of caught up in this common paradigm within academia um, that this is the correct interpretation. Now, I, what I want to suggest to you Today is what I call the consistent future interpretation or the consistent futurist interpretation. And so I've got another chart here, very simple, which is to say that verses 3 through 12, all of the vision has its ultimate fulfillment in the last days. This is not to say that the events of history with Medo-Persia and Alexander the Great, that those did not have shadow fulfillment, that they were not sort of prefigurements of this, but that its ultimate fulfillment from the beginning to the end, all of it has end time prophetic significance. Now I want to look at some of the reasons why I believe that is the case. So in verses 10 through 12, it continues its description of this little horn. This guy that a lot of people say is Antiochus Epiphanes, um, who is a prefigurement of the Antichrist, and it says this, it says, this little horn grew up to the host of heaven. Now, this is language that is most often referring to angels, the angels of heaven. It grew up to the host of heaven. Now, Antiochus Epiphanes didn't do that. That would have to be incredibly overly exaggerated um, language and cause some of the host and the stars to fall to the ground. How did Antiochus Epiphanes fulfill that? And it trampled them down. And it even magnified itself to be equal to the commander of the host. That's basically God. That's Yahweh, that's the Messiah. And it's interesting because I believe that when Paul was writing in 2 Thessalonians, talking about the Antichrist setting himself up in the temple of God, I believe he's actually expounding a bit upon this very verse in both here in Daniel 8 as well as some verses that are in Daniel chapter 11. We won't get into that too much. And it removed, this little horn removes the regular sacrifice, the daily sacrifice, the perpetual sacrifice, and the place of the sanctuary, that's the temple, is thrown down. And so Antiochus Epiphanes did do away with the sacrifice. As I said, he made Judaism Ill illegal. He actually sacrificed a pig on the altar to Zeus and um, l quite literally defiled the entire temple with pork gravy. That's... Like, honestly, what he did, he made pork gravy and spread it all over the temple, which people go like, man, that's really disrespectful. And then I read all these comments from Christians online. They're like, yeah, dip my bullets in pork, you know, for the Muslims. Hallelujah. And I'm like, ah, just, I don't know that that's necessarily in keeping with the spirit of Christ, but good for you. Um, and on account of transgression, the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice. Again, it reiterates the fact that this little horn will be the one who does away with the daily temple sacrifices. It will fling truth to the ground, perform its will, and prosper. Now, the reason that we know that this part of the prophecy, at the very least, is much more than just historical Antiochus Epiphanes is because he didn't fulfill those things. And the book of Revelation... Chapter 12, beginning in verse 3, clearly makes, makes it very clear that these things will be accomplished by Satan and the Antichrist, who is essentially Satan's sock puppet, his human sock puppet, if you will. And so in Revelation 12, it says, Then another sign appeared in the heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, that's the devil, having seven heads and ten horns. We won't get into all of the apocalyptic symbolism here. Ten, uh, seven crowns. His tail swept away a third of the stars from heaven. So now it's alluding back to Daniel 8. It's alluding back to what we just read, except now it's Satan that's fulfilling these things. And again, Satan and the Antichrist, passages often, you look at Isaiah 14, it almost just bleeds from speaking of one to the other quite fluidly. And um, it threw them to the earth. And then it says, the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who's called the devil or Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels, that's the host of heaven, with him. 
So this is the reference. Revelation, in order to understand Revelation, we have to first understand what was being spoken of back in Daniel. This is clearly an end time prophecy, uh, an end time picture of that which will take place just before the return of Jesus. And so it's really in that final seven years that Satan is actually cast out of earth, uh, out of heaven to the earth. Currently, did you know, he still has access to accuse us before the throne. But there'll be a period where he will be cast down to the earth. I don't really pretend to understand what that's going to do in terms of like the spiritual dynamics, but there's going to be something very different during that period. Then in, cha- uh, then in verse 10, it says, then the angels are like shouting and they're all excited. Now the salvation, the power, and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah has come for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He accuses them before God day and night. That's what he does. He accuses us. For this reason, for this reason rejoice, O heavens, and all you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea because the devil's been thrown down. He knows his time is short. So the point is this. It happens in the last days. Daniel 8, this this issue of the little horn going up to heaven and causing these stars to fall to the earth, that is an end time, not a historical event. So we're beginning at the end. We're going to work our way back toward the beginning of the vision. So now we get to the divine interpretation. Again, this is where the angel shows up and tells us what it means. We don't need to guess. And I love this. It's actually Gabriel the angel. Verses 15 through 16, when I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I wanted to understand it. Well, of course he did. And behold, standing before me was one, he looked like a man. I heard the voice of another angel, another man, and he goes, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of the vision. Like, I just, something about that, verse, I just love it. One guy's like, just in case you're wondering who the other angel is, Gabriel, give him understanding. Verse 17, so Gabriel comes near to me where I was standing, and when he came, I was frightened, and I fell on my face, but he said to me, son of man, now everybody pay attention, understand the vision pertains to the time of the end. Daniel, let me explain something to you. Verses 3 through 8 are historical Verses 9 through 12 pertain to the time. No, he doesn't say that. He says, Daniel, listen to me. The vision pertains to the time of the end. Just very straightforward. And then you have this interesting little bit. Now, now, by the way, he's in a vision. Now, while he was talking to me, I sank into a deep sleep. So he had a vision that he's sleeping. What did you dream about last night? I dreamt I was sleeping all night. It was really weird. But so he touched me, and he made me stand up. Get up, Daniel. Let me just reiterate what I just said in case you didn't get it. Behold, I am going to let you know what will occur at the final period of indignation. This is a very common phrase, by the way, particularly throughout Isaiah, but throughout the prophets. Again, in case you didn't get it the second time, let me just say it again a third time, for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. Three times, two sentences, the divine messenger from God goes, Daniel, the vision is about the end times. I have over 150 commentaries on Daniel. There's only one that even touches on exploring this issue that it could, the entirety of the vision could be eschatological. It's just so weird the way tradition can just cause us to not, to miss what's right in front of us. Now, I'm not saying that it's not possible that it doesn't begin with history and bleed into the last days. I'm not saying that's not possible. I'm just saying so far there's no indication of that within the divine messenger's interpretation. And we need to at least consider whether or not the entirety of the vision may have eschatological end time significance. Now, this is where everyone gets caught up. Verses 20 through 21. Gabriel says this Listen, the ram that you saw with the two horns, that represents the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy goat represents the kingdom of, now, the English translations all say Greece. The word there in the Hebrew is Yavon. Sometimes it'll, people just transliterate as Javon. 
And the large horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now, what everyone does is they get here and they go, okay, well, Gabriel just said, Medo-Persia, Yavon. Well, those are ancient names. Therefore, the whole prophecy must be ancient. I go, hold on. I go, why do we suddenly apply this, this rule here that we don't apply anyplace else? We go to Ezekiel 38 and 39. We go clearly in end time prophecy, Gog Magog. And it uses names that go all the way back to Genesis 10 and 11 from the biblical table of nations. You know, Magog, Gomer, Meshach, Tubal. And we don't go, well, those are ancient names, so this must be an ancient prophecy. Because the context of the prophecy is clearly an end time prophecy. We go, these are just names that would have been understood at the time by Ezekiel and his biblically literate Jewish audience. And then we correlate those to regions in our day. We could go to any number of other prophecies where it uses the ancient biblical names. You look at Joel 3, clearly a day of the Lord, return of the G Jesus prophecy, and it goes, what have you against me, O Philistia? We don't go, oh, well, that's Philistia. That's, it doesn't say Palestine. Of course it doesn't use the modern names. It uses the ancient names as they would have been understood in the time of the prophet to correlate to areas and peoples and so forth that we can understand today. So when it says media in Persia, we know that's basically Iran today, as well as possibly some of the Kurdish areas that would correlate, arguably, possibly with the um, media. But then this issue of Greece. Now here, I'm just going to sort of let you in on an interesting little translation matter. There is a huge bias among commentators. Even many conservative commentators have embraced this idea that the book of Daniel was not written by the prophet Daniel, that it was actually written by a Daniel pretender roughly 200 years before Jesus as opposed to 500 years before Jesus when Daniel actually was alive. Um, German higher critical scholarship, they've been going after Daniel for a couple hundred years. Now, the words evolve. Words evolve today. Just try to figure out what your kids are saying on the phone and you know, things constantly changing. Well, that's the case in ancient times as well. And the word Yavon, it went through a development of meaning. Now, 200 years before Jesus, after Alexander the Great had swept all across and tried to Hellenize the whole Middle East, the word Yavon was used to refer to all of the Alexandrian Greek Empire. So Yavon in Greece, by 200 years before Jesus, would have commonly been understood as referring to all of Greek culture, and so forth. But 500 years before Jesus, when Daniel was alive, Yavon would have been understood not to refer to all of Greece or not to refer to the Greek islands, the European Greek islands, but actually specifically Western Asia Minor, Western modern-day Turkey. Because that was, in Daniel's day, what would have been understood as Yavon or Javan. Um, it later came to be known as Ionia, um, or it's uh, also the, the area that was called Lydia. Um, sometimes you'll see that in Ezekiel. Lud is referring to Lydia. Again, western, basically the whole western half of modern-day Turkey. But because there's such a bias, even among interpreters, that rather than just sticking with Yavon, they actually translate it with more of a bias that it was written later, like more like 200 B.C., and they put in Greece. But really, back in Daniel's day, if there was a word that you were trying to use to point to Turkey, Yvonne would have been the best term that you could have used. So that is what is the, the location. And I'm not saying it's not referring to, you know, again, the more European, Zorba the Greek, you know, kind of part of the world. But rather, we're looking at Western uh, Turkey. So again, there's a map, just so you got it. So with that backdrop, you can see what is sort of being laid out. You've got this conflict between Iran and essentially Turkey, Western Turkey. And, you know, the, the ram from Persia and the single horn goat, shaggy goat from Turkey. And what's interesting too, by the way, is, and I won't get into this too much because I need to be done here, is um, 
these two part of the, parts of the world, they've been in conflict for thousands of years. I mean, there's just endless, repeated sort of cycles of, it would be unusual if they weren't in conflict in these last days. Now, here's the thing. Everyone gets to this place where it says, the broken horn, this is verse 22, the broken horn, and then the four horns that arose in its place, they represent four kingdoms which will arise from this nation, not with its power. Every commentary that you read will say, these are the four diadochi. That is a Greek word for the successors of Alexander the Great. Everyone knows that these are the four generals, right? How many have you ever heard that? That the four horns, these are Alexander's generals, his four main generals. The problem is, is that when you actually study history after the death of Alexander, four generals didn't rise up in his place. It, it never happened. That's not how it happened. And so, yet that bias, that sort of, it dominates the commentaries. I'm going to read a, a quote here from John Walvoord, former president of Dallas Theological Seminary. He says, practically all commentators, however, recognize the four horns Notice, practically all commentators recognize the four horns as the four kingdoms. Which ones? Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. Those are the four that Daniel clearly was talking about. And he lays out the areas. Now, here's the thing. I went back to the earliest commentaries that we have in our possession on Daniel or, or any references to Daniel. And here was the interpretation of the earliest Christian um, opinions regarding these issues. Is it battery? Swappy Lou. In 305, Hippolytus, or Hippolytus, he listed Seleucus, Demetrius, Ptolemy, and Philip. Wait a minute. Where's Cassander and Lysimachus? I thought everyone agrees. This is so clear. Ephraim the Syrian, 50 years later, uh, wrote a commentary on Daniel. He agrees with uh, Hippolytus' list. But then Eusebius, in the same year, he goes with Seleucus and Antigonus instead of Demetrius. And then he lists the other two. Jerome, about 50, 52 years later, he goes with Eusebius' list. And then in 430, we have a guy named Theodoret. He was from Syria. He lists Seleucus and Antigonus. But then he throws, in, he throws in Ptolemy, but then he throws in Antipater. Well, wait a minute. Why is it for the first 400 years, Christians couldn't agree on which four, if it was that clear, if it was that easy, why is it that we can't agree? And the reason is when you look at the events, what happened essentially is you had a series of wars, and it took like 15 years before it boiled down between five major generals. Not four, five and it was Lysimachus, Cassander, Ptolemy, Seleucus, and Antigonus. Now, I'll just mention Antigonus. He was much older than all the others. He was blind in one eye, and he was really overweight. And he ran circles around them. So he was like 40 years older than most of these other guys. He's re it really is just like um, that John Wayne movie, uh, which, which is it? And then, um, what's his name, redid it? True grit. It's just like that. I'm old and fat. You know, and, and it was not until he was in his 80s, 23 years after Alexander died, that finally Antigonus died in war. He got a spear in him in his 80s. Like, we all eventually slip up. In his 80s. And then you go, okay, well, there's the four, Joel, right? Daniel fulfilled. Nope, because his son Demetrius still took an area. There were five. And then it was like another six years later that Cassander died. But by that point, there were really only two major divisions. There was Seleucus and there was Ptolemy in the south. And then a handful of other divisions. The point is this. Everyone is trying to shoehorn history in to say that Daniel predicted these things exactly. But the truth is history does not align with the prophecy. I'm of the opinion that prophecy is fulfilled. It's usually fulfilled pretty specifically. And so for that reason, among other reasons, I think there's a very solid chance that these things are yet to come. Now, here's an interesting point. It says the prominent horn is the first king of Yavan. A few years ago, I looked at that and I go, well, if we're dealing with right now, and what we're looking at is an Iranian invasion of the Middle East followed by a Turkish response, 
how could, like, for instance, the current president of Turkey, like, that would mean he could maybe be the prominent horn. That wouldn't work. How could he be called the first king of Turkey? That doesn't make sense. And then all of a sudden you have the coup in, in June of, um, I guess we're now a year and a half ago. And all of a sudden, his plans, his name is Erdogan, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the president of Turkey, has set himself up for all intents and purposes as the, the, the new caliph, the new sultan, the new leader, not just of Turkey, but he's almost presenting himself as the leader of the whole Muslim world. And he's doing away with all of the historic checks and balances of the Turkish Republic. And I'm going, I really hate to sort of step out on a limb and say, is it possible that this could be that? That's dangerous. That's why I'm not saying this is that. I'm saying, could it be? But he really has set himself up as the first king of Yavan. I mean, he's set himself up as greater. If you know the history of Turkey with Mustafa Kemal, Ataturk, and all of this, I mean, he's setting himself up to be like greater than Ataturk. And it's possible, it's actually possible that what we're seeing right now is the fulfillment of Daniel 8, which is this sweep in from Iran. And I, I first started teaching on this three years ago, actually sitting up in northern Iraq, up in the Kurdish areas. And I said, if this is the case, then we should expect to see Iran invade Iraq, invade Syria. And now, just a few years later, we have like 60,000 Iranian troops in Syria, right on Israel's border. Qasem Suleiman, the general of, uh, one of the prominent gen Iranian generals there. I mean, this is a foreign invasion. And it's inevitable that there'll be this clash between Turkey and, um, and Iran. Now, I've already gone over two minutes, but I'm going to go over two more, and then I'm going to wrap it up. That's the next major event that we need to be paying attention to. It's a chapter that we need to be paying attention to. The other issue, and I'm just going to touch on it very, very briefly, is Isaiah 19. Um, I believe that, because I want to end it on a positive note. This is an oracle which has several components. It begins with very eschatological language about the Lord coming on a swift cloud to Egypt. This is language of judgment. It's also language of the return of Jesus. And then it lists a series of things. It talks about um, the Nile drying up. It talks about their economy being decimated as a result. It talks about in a foreign invader, a cruel master, and then, because of oppression, because of all of this pain, in Egypt, it says the people of Egypt begin to cry out to the Lord. So what I see there is a prayer movement rises up out of Egypt. And then it says, and we'll skip forward to verse 20, which is the third to the last slide. It will become a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in Egypt, for they will cry to the Lord because of oppressors or oppression. And he will send them a savior and a champion. So this is how it works. We pray to God. He responds. They cry out to the Lord. He sends them a champion and he will deliver them. Verse 21 and 22. Thus the Lord will make himself known to Egypt. Now just to contextualize this. Throughout the Bible. Everything is my people. Israel. My people. Israel. Israel. Israel, my people. Israel, the apple of my eye. Israel, the navel of the earth. Israel, 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 Israel. And then all of a sudden here, in Isaiah 19, the Lord goes, oh, by the way, guys, guess what? The Lord's going to make himself known to the pagans down south. Egypt. And the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day. That's the messianic age. When the Messiah is on the throne. When the son of David is restored. When the knowledge of God is covering the earth. The Egyptians will know Yahweh in that day. They will even worship and sacrifice. They'll go up. They'll make a vow. They'll perform it. Yes, the Lord is going to strike Egypt. He's going to do that. But he will strike it so as to heal. And they will turn to the Lord. He will respond and heal them. And then the Lord goes, oh, and by the way, guys, not only the pagans down south that are your big enemies back in Isaiah's day, the greatest pagan, idolatrous, you know, worshiping all of their pagan uh, Egyptian gods down south that is a big threat, the big enemy, you know, sort of the Isis of Isaiah's day. He goes, not only them, but also the other pagans to the north, the Assyrians. 
I love this. In that day, there's actually going to be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. And the Assyrians will come into Egypt and the Egyptians into Assyria. And the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. And the Jews in Isaiah's day are going, wait, what? I thought it's all about us. And the God goes, yeah, it's always been about you because I love them too. Go back to, didn't you guys read the rest of the sentence in Genesis 12? He said, I'm going to bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And you're going to be a blessing to all the nations. Don't miss the rest of the equation. And then the Lord actually, he like purposefully, this is like the parable of the Good Samaritan where he just throws them a racial, like tweaks them on purpose. And he goes, he goes, the Egyptian, the Assyrians will come into Egypt, Egypt into Assyria. They all worship together. And then he goes this, in that day, this is what's going to be said. Blessed is Egypt, my people. Wait, that's our phrase. Egypt, my people. Assyria, the work of my hands. And Israel's listed third. He just did that to offend the racial sensibilities. And Jesus comes along later and he does the same thing. He goes, hey, look, don't think I can't raise up children of Abraham from these stones. He goes, don't think it's just about race. Don't think it's just about nationalism, you know, these sort of things. So this is the end result of it all. The Lord is presently doing these things. He's saving. He's moving in Egypt. He's moving throughout Iraq and Syria. And a lot of those components of the things, the drying up of the Nile, there's all kinds of prophetic issues there. But it's important to us to study biblical prophecy, to peer into these things, to look at them. But let's never lose focus on the big picture where this whole thing's going in that day. The pagans throughout the Middle East, the Muslim-majority nations will be filled with a mighty remnant of believers, and they will all worship the God of Israel with the Jews together in Jerusalem. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thanks for bearing with me.